this is on here. I'll be out of your way in just a minute. Oh, Debra. Debra? Rosina. Rosina. What's the name of the file? Okay. I don't need to sit. Hmm? Yes, you do. Actually, why don't you take a good corner seat? And we, we, we'll include those two corner seats. Susan, why don't you, if you took here, a corner it. seat and a microphone? I'll get, I'll get chairs. I can stand. Oh, over here? No, this is for you. I've got the microphone. Okay. Yeah, oh, there's one. Would somebody here uh, volunteer to hold Rosina's leg for 20 minutes? Please leave the chair for Rosina. Okay. So this is our. Uh, we we've had a an intense uh, an intense morning with uh, let's see seven speakers, maybe eight. Um, I've tried to keep them to fifteen minutes. Uh, they uh, but it, you know in, in some sense it was a little sad because we heard some great ideas that were barely had a chance to. Uh, to be developed, and this is our chance to to develop them. the The issue on the table is uh, how to uh, have the University of Michigan, or maybe even more generally, universities play a more active role in science policy. And and in some ways, I've heard three different approaches. One is the more academic one of courses and programs that would foster and help students learn. A second is uh, sort of faculty encouragement of policy outreach, starting with uh, Susan's first talk today, just being involved in maybe three different ways with the AAAS, NAS, and NSF that we heard described yesterday, or more involvement of faculty in, in communities through news media, blogs, or less formal with the person sitting next to you on the Delta airplane. Uh, you can't do that on Southwest, by the way. And finally, uh, involvement in legislative and, and executive uh, decision making. And then the other is sort of better, uh, a point that, uh, that, that Sharon raised, sort of better distribution uh, of science research so the public understands a little better what we do and maybe can, can uh, be on our side when it comes to funding. So those are three of the areas, and maybe there are more, but I open the panel, uh, open up to the panel, and then a little later to the floor. Silence. Yes, Susan, thank you. Well, particularly in uh, relation to Gun Tu's uh, comments, I, we ought to raise the issue of being involved in policy making at global level. He's talked about the cross-national comparisons, but we actually do have a whole array of institutions that do science for policy and a little bit of policy for for science at global level. And so we should not be so um, nationally focused that we lose sight of engagement with those. Actually, the uh, one example that came out was the IPCC, uh, certainly as a, as a global level process. But let's just not forget those as we're uh, looking Good. at Thank you. the future yes. for our students. So, would I, I think yeah, make sure the microphones are on, if you would. So I think that another level <coughs> that I think is important for universities is, uh, at least in biomedical research, is uh, seeing themselves as playing a role, an overall intellectual role in the country, uh, as opposed to this tendency of being kind of a financial engine. And we heard a little bit more about that and how that might distort sort of leading to the bad apples or increasing the environment for that. But uh, it, to, to me, there is just kind of an attitudinal change that is needed where we're talking way too much about money and not enough yeah. about science. Yeah. 
and it as much Boy, that's as resonating with uh, everyone <laughs> here. I've not seen so many heads. As much as we can influence the system, with, uh, you know, among ourselves. And what I am afraid of is that even the NIH is saying, you know, you guys need to step up and support your own faculty. We're not just in the business of paying everybody's salary. You shouldn't be just growing on the back of that. What is the commitment of the university to this enterprise? As opposed to here is an opportunity to grab more and more money so our ranking would go up. So there is a change in attitude that we need to help adjust internally so that we are more credible and in the process change the way that our faculty see their role, which is not to keep paying the rent on expensive lab space, but to advance knowledge. I, maybe uh, given all these, uh, uh, the enthusiasm that response, uh, Marvin or Toby, do you have, uh, Marvin? Yeah, I, I think uh, this has been very fascinating. I know many of you at the university, I've worked on a lot of these areas in very uh, pragmatic and functional ways, and I think we forget uh, how many different audiences there are for what we do. And I, I like Homer bringing up the issue of the liberal arts, because in some respects, we, we are using language and approaches that presume people share a fundamental appreciation of data and a certain methodology or epistemology of what is valuable or true. And I think there are many domains right now, and we heard parts of it when people talk about different values, uh, but a lot of people don't even buy the premise that we're operating from, which is that what we do is valuable or that it's good for people. Uh, we all presume that it is so much a part of our culture, it is so embedded in what we do. But there are many people whose derivation of meaning and value is very different. And I think we're, we're at a point in the world where we need to try and understand how do we impact audiences that don't share our language, that don't share our fundamental belief in the, in the nature of what is progress. And, and, so I'm emphasizing that because I think it, it kind of broadens this into what is the responsibility, not just around our own, we're talking about the benefits of funding research, or, you know, I have a lot of people to do for bringing so many venture capitalists to campus, but, you know, there are a lot of things we've promoted and have advanced as part of our interests but I think we may need to revisit how well does the world understand the fundamental premise uh, of our conversation. Susan Collins, yeah. That's sure that one's working. Um, I couldn't agree more with the comments that uh, Marvin made that others have made in this space. Um, and it seems to me that there are multiple ways that we could be doing more to really be intentional about addressing them. One set of ways has to do with thinking more about the different audiences and how we communicate. Um, and time and experience actually matters. The other one, which is something that I, I mentioned to a couple of people um, in the break, that I, I actually am struck um, has not explicitly come up, although to me has been implicit in our day and a half, and that is being more thoughtful, not for all of the research we do, certainly, but perhaps for some of it, about engaging our communities in a different way. And so there are branches of research, community-based participatory research, which is um, certainly done in the public health sphere and a variety of other spheres as well. If one actually takes the time to talk with members of communities, ask what's important to them, and work together with them to design at least some of the research questions, that provides a different type of understanding and buy-in that isn't necessarily using the language of research or science that we might be familiar with that our communities might not be. And so I think that we need to be not only open to but supportive of those types of projects recognizing that they may take more time than the kinds of projects that we are more used to doing that involve just people who speak our language. Raku? Yeah, um, one of the problems that we as scientists have not 
have failed in in communicating is the fact that the economic benefits, the, uh, the benefits of science basic research to our standard of living. Because the old jobs have gone away. Uh, they're not coming back. We have to be innovative. We have to, we cannot compete with the low wage nation. We need to compete. We need to be innovative. In the scale of innovative uh, innovation, we have fallen to number seven or something. And we really need to bring that back. And the only way to do that is basic research. And for it to be funded, we need to explain to the public, which we have not done, why it is crucial for us to support science. So the university has uh, publicists in the different schools, people whose job it is to take our research, our basic research even, and explain it. Uh, are we doing it good enough? Can we do more? Maybe we need to, this is a point Sharon brought up at the end. Sharon, can you, besides nodding, can you? Um, I would say that they, in many, I mean, I'm only familiar with really in, in, in engineering. Uh, I've never been contacted by yeah. And impressed in, say, LSNA to follow up on some of our papers that come out of the physics department because they have physics students on them, for example. The engineering office is, is stronger, but I think it can be stronger. I mean, we were just talking about this with, with Toby and, and, and Marvin and Brian that we need to be, we need to do what MIT does. We need a, a, a press machine that, um, that can get our stuff out there because I, everything we do here is, I mean, we have great research here. It's just that nobody, it's not, not enough people know about it. Yes. Best kept secret ever. Yes. And I think that that's we just we need a, a, a you know a 2015 relevant media and publicity plan university wide. Jim. I, I was at uh, CERN when the Higgs boson was discovered, and. Huh. Uh, and there was a lot of controversy also about uh, black holes destroying the universe when CERN starts up. And uh, there were some famous cases of uh, a scientist uh, being interviewed and was so nervous about this question of black holes destroying the universe <laughs> uh, that uh, the press would ask him that uh, he was asked the question, you know, what is the purpose of CERN and uh, what value to society will that give? And his, he panicked and he said, no, we're not going to destroy the universe. <laughs> Black holes will not destroy the universe. And this was a primary exam training. So what CERN did was they, uh, they brought the BBC in <coughs> and had a training session, which I participated and many other people participated. How do you give an interview? Uh, what are the pitfalls that you can experience? What are the ways that you can use a speak and quotable uh, and quotable ways that are scientifically valid. And uh, I've been thinking about these issues for years and years. And when these BBC professionals came on and told it, there were many things I had never thought of before. Uh, just, just one example out of a, out of a dozen things. Uh, never say first, second, third, yeah. and so on. Because then they can't use it uh, in, when, when you're talking on the television. They need sound bites, and they also they don't want the audience to say, "Wow, he's saying third. What about one and two? This is the third most important thing he said, and everyone giving me that. I want to hear what one and two are." So there were many things like that. So universities to enable faculty to be more effective in communication, communicating with the press, can bring in some expert to do a basic training. This training lasted only four hours, and it was hugely successful. I think. At, uh, at Susan? So there are actually university experts, so we have brought them in and had any of our faculty who would like to meet with a media training expert, either in a group or individually, do that. But it sounds like that's not um, widely known. Um, I, know. I want them. Yeah. Come I can have them on so it may have. It's not at scale, clearly, yeah. right? Um, and so clearly, this is something that would be valuable more broadly. Jen? So, my Make sure your time. I think it's on. Okay. So at my institution, we have similar training, and um, many of the faculty go through that. I actually have a short course that I have started um, and offer to the grad students, and in that, I've been able to get one of the 
public affairs person who does the training to come and do a really squished version of that to the graduate students. And that's actually one of the, the best parts in, in terms of what the students really like about the course is just, I mean, we, he brings in an actual camera and does a, a real interview and then we go back through the I interview. I think we're done with this topic, it. okay. So I, I, I think we, we, it's interesting that this would be the first area that, that uh, of the recommendations that, that we might come up with. It seems pretty straightforward. It may be a little expensive. But getting the word out to the public, the record does a reasonable job, but it's basically to our own community. But getting the word out to the rest of the world, to the New York Times, for example. Uh, I remember uh, a, uh, when I was uh, associate director of energy, uh, John DeChico wrote an article on, on uh, 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 standard gasoline powered vehicles and how they could be uh, competitive with with hybrids, and uh, the the uh, publicity person, I think Susan Nichols at the time, actually had that article in the New York Times uh, within a week, and it made a big impact. Sharon, you look. I was just going to comment that. Made the microphone. I was just going to comment that um, it's it's amazing to me that that this is what we're. I mean, yes, this is what we need, but it's amazing that we need this. We're a billion dollar. <laughs> a year research institute. We do a billion dollars of research a year. We need to act like it. Mm -hmm. I think we, I, we could move on. I, I think this is a clear and uh, enthusiastic topic, but there are other, there are other ways in which, uh, Susan? I just wanted to come back to something that I heard in Jennifer's uh, remarks, because it, it may fall into a policy black hole, and that is the areas that you were calling questionable. Uh, behaviors, uh, because of the combination of things in my position, I get exposed to a lot of the uh, tensions and conflicts over authorship within teams, between graduate students, between postdocs and graduate students, between uh, students and their advisors. Uh, and I'm really astounded by this. But when you think about it in terms of structural pressures, which you were raising, the combination of what the sponsors who we've been talking about expect of faculty with what students need now, the doctoral students, to get out and actually find a job, and then the postdoc sandwiched in the middle in uh, an even tougher position. It's actually not surprising, given the structure of the system, that these, these things happen. But it's a fundamental conflict of interest between the educational role of the university uh, for the students and the research role of the university. And the, it gets played out both in student lives and in faculty members' lives. So I call it a policy black hole because I, it's, you know, if you ask the agencies to address it, they'd say, no, that's the university's problem. And the university might say, but you have all these requirements. How can we do this by ourselves? So uh, I think this might be something to hand to the policy scientists to figure out uh, where we can address that. It's an unintended consequence, I think, of the structure of the Huda? system. And there are probably others out there. We're very bad at studying and identifying unintended uh, consequences, and particularly at developing uh, policy responses to them. So this is, again, along the same lines, but it is about the definition of scientific success. I think universities and our university could start that start a conversation about the definition of scientific success because it has morphed into number of publications in high impact journals, the number of publications as opposed to the quality of publications. And it drives also who gets grants funding and the number of grants and you know and whatever it's fueled by, maybe just having metrics and being able to judge. But the, 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 uh, it is feeding this frenzy for publishing <coughs> and doctoring data, not telling the truth. It does actually affect the credibility. But what I am even more worried about is how it is undermining the view and the enthusiasm of the graduate students and the next generation towards the future of science. I give a lot of talks and a lot of places where we have luncheons with graduate students. 
And I would say even in very distinguished places, eight out of 10 students say, I do not want this life anymore. It yeah. is too stressful, it is too hard, I want to do something else. And my big worry is who is going to do the science in this country? While we are working really hard to try and give our students alternative careers, and this policy could be one of them, we need scientists to actually do the work. And we are turning them off by either ignoring them or acting so frazzled that we do not pay attention to them and also giving them the vibe that it's not about the truth, it's not about passion, it's not about knowledge, it's about scoring. And so I hope our university can take the lead in starting this conversation and helping change that because it will permeate review committees and tenure committees and so on. Why not start that? So Rackham has had a an initiative on mentoring and uh, you know, discussions around campus, but that is more about the quality of the mentoring and not the quality of, of the science. Actually, I would push it uh, one step further, and I think it's one of the suggestions I had, and that's really what I hear food is saying, is let's evaluate the culture yes. of science that we've created. I mean, uh, there's a lot, we had a lot of talk um, over the last day and a half about engaging with the public. Well, that comes right in tension with what we're supposed to be doing to progress through our career. Engaging with the public does not get put on my CV and does not count as one of the you know, many publications I have to have to advance to the next career. It does, it's in the way of publishing, of getting a grant out. So I think, I think what I hear Huda saying is not just mentoring, but actually the whole system. I, you, I think you're exactly right. Any, uh, I was uh, struck by Jim's uh, recollection of the PDC workshop. Uh, that this communication to the public was something he had thought about for many years and discovered that there were many tools and resources that he was unaware of. And uh, much the same is true of uh, education. Uh, our biggest audience actually is our students and most of the public are university educated, so their understanding and appreciation of science is partly a product of what we communicate to them. Uh, and in the same way, education, teaching, is frequently treated as something that's intuitive or self-evident, but there are there is a certain kind of professional knowledge. We view K-12 as the arena of which people have much to learn, but maybe university instructors have much to learn as well. So by the way, this is Hyman Bass, who is a professor of both mathematics and education and, and has uh, the Presidential Medal of Science to, uh, to back up his statement. I, I worry a little bit about some of this conversation because we're just trying to solve some problems, environment of the student, you know, faculty and, and things that they do. And I, there's a certain despondency that comes to me when I hear these conversations because we're sort of ignoring this external environment in which we are operating and which our future scientists are going to operate. I mean, you say, why would, why would students be in despair about the environment and the things that they're going into? In part because they look out there and say, if my job, if I have to be raising money in order to do my research, and in the environment where the NSF only funds 20% of, of the proposals, and the NIH, as I recall, uh, it, the first time you have any expectation of being a PI was about age 45. And, and so in that environment, that is one of the things that, that I think discourages our students and so forth when going forward. We can't control that. Now, we can make them, and in some ways I think we, we, we would run a risk if we made a happy environment here, which was divorced from the real world that they're going to, going to fall into, and that that might be, might be a good thing. 
that might be a, that would be a bad thing for us, us, I think, to do. So that's one of the dimensions that I think we have to address when we think about these these what we do with our own students here. The second thing that bothers me a little bit when we have these conversations, we talk about engaging with the public. Absolutely, I'm all in favor of it. The question is, why? Now we do it because we would like public support. Do we do it because we want public support? Because that will in turn influence the, the Congress and the funding agency and that that flows back into more research dollars. Is that one of our gains? And then you say, but just look at the political situation that we find ourselves in. The, the public is both, the Congress is basically divorced from the public public. Gerrymandering in the Congress has created a Congress which is only elected by a tiny fraction of the population. Now, I think if we play to, a, if we say we are playing to the long term, that if we in fact are trying to create a body politic that will eventually result in this, I'm absolutely convinced that's, that's true. It's the only way we're going to do it. And we should be very, we do it, but we should recognize what we're doing. We're not going to solve a, a congressional policy because of the nature of our Congress at the moment. But on the other hand, if we say, like all good things we do at universities, we're in this for the long term, then absolutely, we, we are the only, this is the only way we will ever change this situation is to do that public outreach and create a body, body politic that recognizes the importance of what we do. So I completely agree that we, uh, the, that we have to be realistic with our mentees, that it's a tough and competitive world out there. And we also need to do whatever we can to make it, you know, uh, more, uh, you know, I mean, to make the success rates higher if we can do all of this. So I'm with you on this. So I think that the students are well aware, unless I'm wrapping them in a bubble, they know how much of my time I'm spending writing grants and, uh, you know, putting the energy. They help with the process and I share with them the, the commentaries back. To my mind, the best antidote to the despair is for them to understand why I still love to do this <laughs> and why this is still important. And if I make it about a high impact factor journal, that is not the same as why this is really important and exciting. And if I turn it into a game of one-upsmanship or you know, uh, citation indexes or whatever, uh, they are gone. We have to remember why we fell in love with science and keep that going. So that's really all I wanted to say, is that there is enough reality out there. Let's just give the positive back. If we could only bottle and sell who does, uh, <laughs> joie and, and enthusiasm, it, 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 it shows wonderfully. James? So that's one aspect of your question that very excellently responded to. The other aspect is uh, why do we engage with the public? And uh, the, the way I view it is, um, when we do research, we have multiple products that we uh, make. We have a product that helps solve societal problems. We have a product of education that then can spill into many different areas besides the very narrow area of what, you, uh, what you're doing. And the other product is that um, there is this tremendous thirst in society to know where they stand in the universe, to, to put it grandly. And we see this in biology, we see this in, uh, in physics, we see this in chemistry, and uh, we have a Saturday morning physics program that we run every, every Saturday, almost every Saturday during the school year, except for football Saturday, That's, uh, we can't go against that. Uh, and we have hundreds of people that come yes. out. Right. Incredible number of standing room only and people outside in the snow. People yeah. coming around, uh, they, they're in the other auditorium. I gave a talk once and uh, and then it was 20 students that came down to get my autograph when I was done, and I was so proud until I found out that they needed it for extra credit. For <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but in any event, uh, it's that the thirst for understanding where do you where are you in 
you know, in this universe is powerful and I consider it one of the products of our research and why I think we should engage with the public. Toby? I just wanted to comment because I think Hyman said something that I think a lot about working, working on the... I mentioned the, uh, the AAU undergraduate teaching initiative. And I'm reminded of a meeting I had with Lamar Smith, who now shares the science committee. He'll tell you about how he was really interested in astronomy, and then he had his first year astronomy course. He's still very interested in astronomy, but at that point, he realized maybe he wasn't going to be a scientist. And one of the problems, and there's a great book by Stuart Firestein called Ignorance, and I, don't, I recommend it to all of you. He talks about how he got bored teaching his introductory science, neuroscience, he's a neuroscientist. Um, because he realized he was just teaching the facts, he was teaching what he knew, not what really excited him about science, which was what he didn't know. And so he started a course called Ignorance, uh, which is where he invites other faculty to come and talk about what they don't know. And I think we lose that with students, but also when we talk about communications with members of Congress, you need to, or, or anybody, I, I often think that there are a lot of members of Congress and we don't give them enough credit because they actually do value science. They, they really do understand its importance. But we often start at a place that they're not at and don't go back to the real excitement. And that's when, when it comes down to it, that's where we need to start in terms of the communications piece. So I'm resonating with a lot of what's being said. In fact, uh, science writers always tell you, never start with the science. Start with yourself and your passion, your interest in the science problem. If you read all of these popular science books, they're not just about the science, they're about the scientists who do the science. And, and, uh, and that's just a, that's another way to, to engage. Um, yeah, I'm wondering about if there are certain um, action items or things we can do. So we've heard a lot about organizing and um, in public policy and, and speaking to Congress whoever else will listen. And I'm wondering if this is something that, uh, where every department can have something like a precinct head or a, a uh, designated person who is directly involved in doing this. In, in, in my field, astronomy, there's, we have a, a lot of emails back and forth and suggestions from the professional community number of us go to Washington. There is a professional uh, policy person in Washington. And so I'm wondering, it, so, so we, we might be able to do this, I'm wondering how effective that actually is. So it's uh, sort of back to the other suggestion that has uh, been uh, mentioned many times today and yesterday, and that is, uh, having a culture that encourages faculty to participate in, in, with, uh, in DC, for example, or Lansing. Uh, probably easier in engineering than in physics, just because it's, uh, uh, that outreach is more important. There are here. But I think there's a couple of, 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 uh, of levels that, that we can do. Right? There's one thing in getting people who've never been involved in science policy or don't recognize that they are or could be getting them involved. But I would love to see something that helps those of us who already know what we're doing and we're already really engaged, connected to one another. Um, that I learned so much here about how many people at Michigan are doing all these different things and, and that's a fantastic resource. Um, and I, So I'd love to see some kind of science and technology policy group at Michigan. That, huh. that we start, we just start talking. Yeah. Interesting idea. That's another very actionable suggestion, I think. Uh, uh, you know, uh, th there are many of us who participate in National Academy panels, uh, and, 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 and it's also a good group. I'm, as, as I mentioned earlier, you dragged me into a, a, a National Academy panel that I found really interesting and, and uh, be a good source, a good sort of intermediary to help accomplish this. Huda. Um, well, just, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, and Susan first. So okay. just very quickly, first of all, I like that idea very much. I also um, was gonna make the point that in terms of would it have an impact 
I think in terms of the importance of relationships in some of these, I mean, it's very hard to come in one off um, and really be at the right time and to be able to have an impact. And so I think that um, ultimately one needs to think in terms of developing those relationships and figuring out ways to do that that recognizes that, you know, the day job of most of the people here is the research they're doing, the teaching they're doing. Um, and so while this might be part of what they do, so what are ways to do that? Um, one of the things the Ford School is about to experiment with is, is, is kind of trying to embed some of our students in congressional offices. That means that there's someone there all the time who can help connect back with us when there are topics that our expertise might be valuable on. And so finding ways, perhaps like that, perhaps there are other ways as well, to have ongoing relationships with key people, I think is going to ultimately have a bigger impact than things that come in and out. And there are other ways, and many people here have already talked about structures and ways to do that, but that's one thought. Huda and then Homer. So the comment about astronomy reminded me of something. I am married to a, a scientist, but he happens to also be an amateur astronomer. And it, made, it has made me realize that this is a community where the amateurs really get to know a lot about certain aspects of the field and are very engaged and uh, see themselves as actually kind of important. And, you know, they come from all walks of life. And the, Typically a bunch of geeks, but they, you know, they love, they love what they do. <laughs> so, but it made me realize that maybe we could take that model and enlarge it a little bit, where because a lot of people would love to be kind of amateur scientists, but there isn't, there aren't that many opportunities. Where lately there have been a couple of examples in neuroscience where they have a ton of data images that they post online and they create a group community of young people who love to do computer stuff, who are helping them with the quantitation, and they, every, they compete with each other about who quantitates more EM images and how they're doing it. They check each other out. They have sort of virtual meetings of this work group and so on. So I guess what I'm saying more broadly is that then maybe we can start thinking about experiments to engage the public in being part of science. Yeah. So, so the president in his uh, comments yesterday morning asked for concrete suggestions to, to uh, uh, further the things we're talking about and, and having an office or people who be, actually carry out these uh, might be a, a, a way to start. By the way, speaking of amateur astronomy, I hope you, if it's clear tonight or tomorrow, if you look to the west, you will see only one star, that's Venus. And if you look up next to the moon, that's Jupiter. Who's an animal? Everyone's an animal. Uh, Homer, you uh, had your hand up. Into the microphone, please. Yeah, bring it up, people. Okay, great. That was glued down. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to comment that at one of our organizing committee meetings, uh, the question was actually debated uh, as to whether or not maybe once a month or a couple of times a month there could be a um, a dinner, or at least a snack uh, meeting, where uh, individuals could share their experiences, but we could also invite uh, students on some rolling basis, especially those that are deeply interested in going into science policy. There are the science cafes, which I have found to be uh, pretty exciting vehicles for exactly this, often over beer and, and pretzels. I mean, a wonderful venue. Harris runs this from the science, from the, uh, from the museum. Yeah. Eight or ten sessions done at the Irish. Yeah. So Amy Harris, is it? Uh, yeah. Um, a couple of thoughts that the person here. One, one of the things when we talk about public outreach, I'm still chewing on Len's question of why I know this was passed, but um, one of the reasons we want to do this is, I think, because at base, the public pays for us, right? We're a public good. 
And what we don't do a very good job of is explaining what the people who are sort of investing in our work do. You know, I, I mean, if you go to a football game, you notice when they come charging out of the tunnel, they, you know, the announcer yells, these are your Michigan Wolverines, right? There's no equivalent. Um, and I'm not suggesting we, we have a bunch of physicists and sociologists run out of the tunnel, but if we were to do this kind of outreach and if we were to sync it up, even in small ways with something like the bicentennial celebrations that are being planned for the university. So there was a sense that, you know, in addition to pursuing our own individual passions for this stuff, a large part of why you go into a job like this is because, especially at a university like this one, which has the long storied history, is out of some sense that there is a public component to the job. And so I think that if we could think about outreach in those, if we could think about high profile places that celebrate the university as a sort of unique institution to allow that to happen on the back, not of football or basketball, but of discovery. <laughs> so we need to give uh, uh, Rosina and Deborah a chance to, uh, and so thank you. Uh, I, I, think, I think we have some really concrete suggestions. So and I'll invite uh, uh, our two, uh, Dean, Dean, <coughs> Dean Deborah and Dean Pegleg, to uh, <laughs> come up and, and, and pull all this together. You know, on that last comment, um, in my opening remarks yesterday, I said that President Obama invites the mathletes and the athletes to the White House, and I think that's an interesting point, that our science and mathletes should be celebrated as much as our athletes. Okay, so Deborah and I are going to do a tag team. Here's what have we learned. Um, I think a couple of big picture messages, starting with policy making or making the sausage has become a noble endeavor. And if we do not participate in the making of science policy, we're gonna hate breakfast tomorrow. When I became a congressional fellow, and actually I forgot to tell you yesterday that Jerome Wiesner chaired the group that picked me as the OTA fellow. Um, it was considered, I, I mean, one of my advisors told me I was prostituting myself by leaving the ivory tower to work at the science policy interface. That's no longer true. We clearly think this is an important thing. We've had a lot of discussions about the role of the university in both advancing science for policy and policy for science. Huge role for both of these. A lot of science underpinning wise policy yet to be <coughs> discovered. Uh, and so we at a university have the great breadth and depth. I think a hundred of our departments on this campus are in the top 10. Incredible breadth and depth, and students and faculty to think through real world problems, all the way from the basic science to the societal solutions. Not as much talk as I would have hoped um, on the private sector. We heard Dr. Holdren say yesterday how the private sector is becoming more important in everything and even funding basic science. But the uh, convening power of the university to bring together public-private partnerships, of which we have many on this campus already, uh, should not be underplayed. And universities are always seen as kind of neutral meeting places. In fact, years ago, we were able to develop mitigation options for the state of Michigan across the sectors involved through our Center for Sustainable Systems by doing it at the university. People felt kind of safe to do it in a non-policy setting. So these kind of huge advances can happen and don't leave out the uh, private sector. And we heard over and over again that we should encourage participation at all levels, from the op-ed to the 10% or more tithers, uh, and that we need all of these in the science policy realm, as our goal has got to be a more scientifically literate populace. And so that involves uh, talking to your grandfather, to your children, to your uh, rotary clubs, as well as to the science federal agencies, et cetera. So we, had, we want to start with some simple things. We're not starting from nothing. There's a lot to build on. So I think one thing that we, we would find very useful would be let's actually put together a compendium of courses in whole or in part that touch on science policy. So for example, last winter, three climate policy courses were taught in three different schools at exactly the same time. And we figured out that we were splitting the population. But with one of us in environment, one in law, and one in policy, we could actually create a, a more 
reasonable sequence. We did this once to figure out how many environment courses are on campus. Why don't we do it for policy? We've got a thousand student groups, and I get invited by the energy group and the science policy groups. And all. Let's figure out if there are synergies among our student group. Who is that population that's most interested, <coughs> and can we have some common meetings? Um, the Europe students are increasingly interested, and I think the REU students, in working at this kind of science policy interface on these big reports that we're working on. Can we engage students? The PCAST report on private sector adaptation that I'm doing is involving a student who's doing a dual degree in business and SNRE. So I think these are very, we should think of more interesting ways to engage them in the work we're doing anyway. And Susan's idea <laughs> at the bottom of this slide, uh, more community-based participatory research. And I think this is important for so many reasons. It helped design the questions that society once answered. I could tell you when we did the first US national climate assessment, we decided the information that farmers would want to know about climate change and handed it to them. And we were completely wrong because we gave them average temperatures and ozone concentrations in the summer, and they really wanted dates of first frost, last frost, etc. So if you're not answering relevant questions, your science won't be used. And that will also give students real world experience and help us learn what society cares about. There's a lot of project-based requirements in the professional schools, and maybe this kind could be expanded as we go forward. Um, and from the president down, we need a signal that the campuses must cultivate a culture of communication, public service, and civic scientists. This has to be valued at the very top, or all the things we are talking about uh, will, will not <laughs> emanate. And so since communication is very, very important, we want to spend a few slides on this. So we heard this throughout the uh, to two, day and a half talk about communication. We heard it a lot in the last session, but it was coming up yesterday as well. So we wanted to make a couple of, pull a couple of points forward for recommendations about two aspects of communication, that communication both of, of and about science and what else there is to understand and how we might create infrastructure for that on our campus. So one way to think about this is that like uh, several people, and I think I said this as well, that teaching isn't common sense. This is essentially a form of teaching. It's not always clear that uh, those of us who do research think about it clearly enough that way. Recently, I was um, charged with bringing some people to speak to the National Science Board on a particular topic, and I realized as I surveyed people in the fields that I was considering that only a few people I could think of would understand what it meant to present the particular thing we were discussing on the board to the board, that they would have to think not just about what they had to say, but how they could make, how they could make inferences about what National Science Board members might already believe about what they were coming to talk about. About. And in the end, I picked two people who did an astounding job. But it was interesting to me as I traced my thinking who would actually have that orientation. So, you know, we've talked about a number of types of learners, if you want to think about this as teaching, policymakers, others on campus. We've talked about undergraduate students earlier today that we're actually responsible for the kinds of attitudes that people might leave universities, at least our own, when they go out to become members of the public. Um, the media, there are several very interesting examples today about what it might mean to talk sensibly to someone whose job it is to do journalism. So what are they like? What do they need to learn? And how are they thinking about what they're doing? I thought what James said a little while ago is absolutely right. When I got one of my rounds of training, what, I was, ex what was explained to me is when a newspaper writer contacts you for an article and already has the story more or less developed, he or she is looking for a quote. So, Instead of thinking you're having a conversation with this person for 10 minutes on the phone, think about what you might want to be quoted for and say that, almost irrespective of what you get asked. And that works very well, but it's not a natural way to think about a 10-minute phone conversation. You think the person's asking you your views on some topic, then you say a lot of things first, second, third, or something else that isn't quotable at all, or worse, you're misquoted. So that orientation to think, what are they up to, what do they understand, and what are you doing, isn't obvious or common sense. Um, so in many ways, this is about thinking about communicating with an other orientation, thinking about whom we're talking to rather than what we have to say. And that's, we're so passionate about, as Huda keeps saying, about what we think that mm -hmm. that can get in the way. Our passion has to be in some sense translated to and connected to the people we're talking to. And while this may sound obvious, 
Many, many of us are not very good at this, so it is important to start thinking. And I would like to bring back one other point that I tried to make yesterday when I spoke about K-12, but I fear that we're not remembering it. The American population is changing dramatically. So when we think about whom we're the public, the public is not like the people who have been in this room. And we need to be thinking about who are the youth that are coming up, who are the people who are actually already outside of this very special place that we inhabit, and thinking about the communication across many kinds of important human difference is a very big part of it. It's not just how do we communicate science, it's how are we being seen and perceived? And sometimes we act rather oblivious to that. So this is all about <laughs> learning to think about the listener much more in the way that we're talking. So that's all fine and dandy to say. So what are ways that we could be working on this? We heard both in the Google Doc and things that people said that there are actual things that could be done rather than just exhorting everyone to do better at this. Watching effective testimonies. These are all video, many of these are videotaped and one can learn a lot from watching better ones, ones that were acclaimed as being helpful. What were their features? Or reading skillful interviews, when our colleagues achieve the accomplishment of actually being quoted in an effective way, what is it that they did? Having some case examples that we could look at. We've heard about the value of having the kind of training that Susan spoke about. A number of us have had that. Actually incredibly helpful, even for people who have become relatively skillful. There's always more to learn about being effective about it. And some of it's discipline specific. So some of it depends on what it is you have to talk about. Education, as you can imagine, education policy has plenty of challenges since everyone already has a view. And I can get the same kind of reactions from being misquoted as James got from the story he told us. But some of this is also general. We can literally practice radio interviews or TV interviews, and I think we heard examples of that today. Our faculty at the School of Education have had training by people who come in and actually do this in a fishbowl while others watch, and it has really elevated the skill of many people in our faculty. In fact, we're basically saying we have to learn how to do this rather special kind of teaching, and people who are in roles like we have both been in have responsibility for creating those opportunities on campus as university leaders. Um, but it's also, I think as Susan said earlier, not just about what we think of as communication, it's also learning more broadly about the environments in which all of this is taking place. So there is more to learn about the politics of research funding or what's going on in Congress. There's more to understand about what policy actually is and how it takes effect. So it's not just communicating your ideas, it's learning a broader broader array of things, and I think we heard very clear examples of why the certificate program is so powerful and what the examples you gave us of what people go off to do. And there are presumably other possibilities for faculty and staff. Someone commented, let's not forget our research staff who mm -hmm. end up doing a great deal of communicating. It's not all faculty and students. And obviously, and Rosina already said some things, there are some basic things that deans and other university leaders could be doing to amplify the ways in which we reward and recognize this kind of work in the way what we expect people to report, how we feature it, how we talk about it on our faculty at, at faculty meetings, how we feature cases of engagement. There is actually a lot we could do to lead in the ways that you described to break down some of the ways that we may inadvertently be communicating on our campus what's valued to our faculty and to our students. So these are things that we could actually do something about and I think many people would be interested in collaborating to think of we do that in a more systematic way. And so here are some more proposed next steps. We would suggest that faculty be required to report uh, on their outreach and their annual reports to the dean, to the provost, and be cited and highlighted in promotion cases. And those outreach activities can be local, state, federal policymakers of various types, rotary clubs, high school retirement community student groups, and popular science communication op-eds, policy for a press, and the then now imagine that's become codified through this conference. Um, but also, we need to have a culture of actively encouraging faculty to serve on advisory committees, whether it's for federal agencies, whether it's for the National Research Council, for AAAS, and importantly, for state and local boards, and on, on uh, various advisory committees to enhance our own campus. And to make the university better known in the White House, Congress, and the State House. I had uh, interns for 21 years in the White House and in Congress, and never once was I offered a Michigan intern. I know that's changing. 
but some of the schools just run rings around us and sort of figuring out what might be useful where. Um, so I would suggest that we advertise ourselves in every way possible. We could do symposia on things that we're really well known for. We could do some of these in DC. We could do some of them in our hometown. Lots of technical value that we could bring to a broader community. And make sure we don't just hold the thing, but we actually produce proceedings and publications and share them. And you're not done when you finish the report. You have to brief them, brief them, brief them. And require, encourage, um, cajole folks to actually know their elected officials and be a resource to them. As we heard throughout the day yesterday, if people know you and trust you, they will consult you. You will become a resource. You'll be invited into the hallowed halls of Congress or the White House. Um, we would like to suggest that the university considering, consider offer training in both kind of management and communication skills for the university folks who aspire to science management or government policy roles. Should there be something like an STPP for faculty, uh, especially communication with Congress? Um, that could happen on campus. There might be a way to do it with the AAAS. AGU's tried this, the Ecological Society of America's tried it. So it could be anything from a half day to a, sem a semester long. Then we really think not just encourage new PhDs or AAAS fellows to be uh, spread through Washington, but really encourage our IPAs, um, the Interpersonnel Act loans, to federal agencies who could desperately use the kind of talent that our mid-career scientists have and encourage a sabbatical year uh, to go to the federal agencies or the White House or international organizations like the World Bank. And then when these people come back, they are incredible resources to our campus as well. And I think we could create some excitement about this. Many of you mentioned ideas, peer-to-peer -peer venues, dinner symposia, and make it an honor for us to be invited to them. But we didn't talk very much about the other side, about kind of training the policymakers about science. And I think this is worth thinking more about. And I'm just going to throw out a couple ideas we came up with. Um, we do exec ed for the business community. Could we do exec ed for federal and state policy staff? So for example, 80% of the people in federal agencies that do ecological work are 50 or older. They were not trained in ecosystem management. Um, similarly, I'm sure there are many staffers in the Congress and federal agencies who'd like to know more about cybersecurity or computational biology or lightweighting materials or demography of aging or public opinion on climate change. And we could think about whether there would be a way that we could bring people here for again from a half day to a week in the summer at the biological station or in Washington and give them some in-depth training on the science issues that they cover but never have time to learn in any depth. And that way we begin again this two-way exchange, learning from each other, we become colleagues, we become resources and a known entity. So that would build both personal relationships and the campus reputation. For students, I already mentioned, let's do a very concerted effort to get students in internships in the federal agency in Congress, as Susan mentioned, in OSTP in the White House, and many universities, particularly on the coast, make this really easy to happen. It's best if we can support those students. And so if we can build on the program we already have in Washington, I think this would be great. Let's not ignore Lansing. And I think the state houses uh, could really use some help too. And I think summer internships or semester long internships to help with our members of the state legislature would be very, very important. Very little science expertise residing there either. Obviously encourage the students to go on and become AAAS fellows. I think we should maintain a really good directory of those students who go on to be AAAS fellows or go on to policy positions and bring them back and have them help mentor the next group. Um, the STPP certificate already very strong. Let's think about, should, are there more things that can be done in that arena? And um, Homer's question of a science policy class for all PhDs. And really, you know, some mechanism to support regular interactions between the interested students and faculty and to use those of us who serve in these positions uh, more broadly.
So those are our initial recommendations. Lots more to think about, but I hope that gives you some food for thought. And as you know, we uh, want to remain the leaders in the best. I actually didn't know that this, this phrase came from a student in 1898. So I think, of course, the students are going to be our leaders, and we want to remain to be the leaders in the best. So um, with more involvement with the public policy sector, I think Michigan can soar to even greater heights. I only have, uh, well, there are two functions that are left. One is to make sure we all recognize members of the organizing committee. Could you please raise your hand or stand just so the, we can ask for, uh, okay, it's a terribly good group. <laughs> yeah, they, they put together I think a very fine program. And finally, uh, Lois Vasquez, the lady up here. Uh, it's remarkable the amount of effort required as you uh, manage the arrival of uh, several people from different parts of the country to work on the program, to uh, work on the uh, uh, meals and things of that nature. She, she did a fantastic job, I think. About Lois? She not only managed all those things, but she also had substantive suggestions many times, so she was very substantively engaged. Yes, yes, that's correct. So thank you, Lois. <laughs> and if I remember the program, we're done except for lunch. That's correct. Okay, thank you, Th thank you all for coming. <laughs>